Shalom, Erev Tov, good night, good evening, <laughs> good evening. This is TMS Roundtable Global. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein, and we stream live here every Monday. We are approaching our two-year anniversary, Rose and I, who I'm going to introduce Rose, and she'll introduce our guest in a minute. But I did want to say that um, we stream live weekly on Monday nights or afternoons, depending on your local time. Um, we started this show to inspire and educate many people about self-healing, chronic pain, and autoimmune disease. Anyway, all that to say, let's get started. Rose, good, good morning. Good morning, Tava. <laughs> good morning, Tava. Now, this morning we've got Dr. Bethany Rains. Now, she's a cognitive neuroscientist. If you think about it, you know, we have got something like predictive texting, we do a text, we do a message to people, and the computer actually decides what we should say. Sometimes those things don't really work out. And the other thing is I spoke to Dr. Raines, I realised that, you know, we have a whole system going on in our computers, which is, well, how would you put it? It's sort of a replica of the brain, and we have algorithms. Now, our algorithms within our brains will actually set up the idea that a certain thing is dangerous and create fear. Now, Dr. Raines has got years and years of experience in this area. She's worked in the military, she's worked with chronic pain, and she's also worked in the general area of uh, neuroscience. So welcome, Dr. Raines, and thank you so much for spending time with us. And firstly, maybe just give us a broad overview of how or the bottom up sort of experience of pain, how it comes from a wound, for example, but then it also comes from a thought. So if you would maybe share that in the beginning and then we'll unfold and bring it all out. And please, anyone listening, please ask Dr. Raines anything you need to know because she is has a vast, vast knowledge of experience within this area. And we're so pleased that you've given us the time and our audience the time Good job, Rose, for finding you. Bethany. Good job, Rose. <laughs> well, thank you both. I, I really appreciate being able to come on. I love this topic and I love this area. Um, I've always been a big fan. I'm a little bit of a weirdo in the cognitive neuroscience side of things because what I really love is the application of what we find in cognitive neuroscience to questions and problems like these. So to your question, uh, Rose, the top down versus bottom up, that's a phrase that is probably very familiar to folks who have done any top kind of a neuroscience down, course. Top down, bottom up. Top yes, down, and so up. top down and bottom up refer to how we talk about the signaling uh, throughout the nervous system. So our nervous system is what we call bidirectional, which means that you can go either way through the nerves. And top down is a signal that originates from the brain. And it can also originate from what we consider kind of like higher levels of the brain. There's some scientists who refer to that, uh, things like your prefrontal cortex, where we have like those executive functions can go down to the parts of your brain that are more kind of boots on the ground closer. They initiate a lot more of the bodily functions. And then converse to that, there's the bottom up. These are the things that the nerves in our body send up to our brain. So we have that information and we can act on it accordingly. So those are things that traditionally in what we call the biomedical approach to pain, that's all that was really focused on, that our nervous system sends these signals up, but they never thought about the signals coming down. And so mm -hmm. there's this idea that if you can sort of sever that connection, either chemically or surgically, um, you shouldn't be able to feel pain, right? And um, the idea that if there is pain, it's a definite, signal that there's damage or structural abnormality in the body because that is what pain was evolved to tell us about right it was our little alarm system for hey don't do that it will cause damage i think my favorite case example of why this is not the full story would be something like phantom limb pain which we're yes. all very familiar with you can literally lose an entire limb and it happens often in military populations in particular right or um, unfortunately exposed to a lot of those kinds of injuries, despite the, the entire limb or the entire part of the body being gone, that part of your nervous system no longer exists, 
you still get signals from it somehow. And you'll have patients that report things like itching or pain, you know, um, achy feelings or just unusual feelings that they can't resolve. And if we only look at the bottom up theory, that's it's like a ghost story. What's going on? You know, those, those nerves aren't there. So it helps us to, to reflect on, well, what is activating that? It's a very real feeling. And uh, we, you know, what, what can you do? There are interesting therapies for it that we found. Um, if you guys are familiar with like mirror therapy, where yeah, you can just heard about it, yeah. help somebody to where you give their sensory organs, particularly your eyes, right? Which are our most um, kind of authoritative sensory organ that most of us have. Uh, if you can see it, and you can sort of itch it or massage it and it's in a mirror. Uh, VR is really great for this too, where it can kind of give you that mirror therapy. You can actually resolve it because what you've now done is you've had a signal from the sensory parts of your brain, sending it to those parts of your brain that are activating pain or discomfort in some way and resolving it from a top down. Is it kind of like fool? Is it kind of like fooling the brain a little bit? Like I guess you could say that we're we're sort of fooled all the time. I, I like to, to remind people that we're really just this like this gelatinous mass that lives in a, a meat robot suit. And we don't really know what's real, right? We, we know what our nervous system tells us. And so, you know, there's all kinds of ways that we're quote unquote fooled. Um, and a lot of that comes from the fact that our brain doesn't react objectively to the world in a lot of ways people think it does. And pain is no different. So, if you waited around until your sensory signals gave you all the information you needed to react, you would have been eaten by a saber toothed tiger well before your lineage ever was created, right? We, we just don't react that quickly as humans. And um, one of the things we've recently started to learn and, and sort of um, expand on in cognitive neuroscience as a field is the idea that we predict much more often than we react. Yes. And so, those predictions are based on memories and they're based on previous experiences. And so if you've had a previous experience, you've learned it, you can reactivate those circuits and it, it tends to start to proactively prepare you for what comes next. And so yeah. it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, and when it comes to pain, it really, again, helps us to understand these top down activations of it. If you've had an experience your brain kind of expects it and it can actually create it, activate that part of the brain before you actually react to anything. Well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to break it down for just to make it a little easier. Cause um, just the, the explanation. Cause I, I, it's, 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 a, it gets a little bit intellectual for even me. And it's beautiful. You have incredible hold on the, on, on the topic. But what I learned recently was that if we can imagine feeling at less pain, or I can imagine, God forbid, having no cancer, or I can imagine, you know, sitting longer without pain. They say that your brain begins to believe it. Sure. Like yeah. you're journaling and all. So can you talk about that? Because that's what a lot of our listeners are involved with. And there's a lot of people who I've met in Israel who've healed cancer from just imagining, imagination, all these deep mindfulness things and um, there's something there with the brain the brain's doing that so absolutely um imagination is um let's see we're gonna kind of start with this so all of the different pathways that you can make in your brain all the possible roads between all of those cells they're they're countless and they're always changing and so you can think of imagination or daydreaming or or things like you know setting intentions or visualizing, which is a huge part of mindfulness practice and things like that, as sort of your way of, of creating a pathway, a sensory pathway that's not really happening based on your memories of that. So what would it look like based on other things that you've seen? You've seen so many things in your life. You can sort of activate those neuron pathways and activate them in a weaker way um, by visualizing and doing things like that. You're, you're activating a couple of pathways in your brain. It tends not to be as powerful, right? Unless you're talking about a hallucination when you can't tell the difference between an activation that's top down or bottom up, uh, which is very, very much um, an issue with some folks that have psychotic disorders. But for most of us that aren't dealing with that, um, you know, we can usually tell the difference between something we've top down activated from our 
you know, kind of front brain, the part we have control well, over, and we yeah. say, hey, make this happen. Uh, and something we're actually seeing bottom up coming from like our, our optic nerve, right? So um, when you do that, you're creating those roads. And it's a little bit like a pathway that's created organically in a forest. If you go through it once, you won't be able to tell somebody really went through there. But if you're going back and forth on this pathway consistently, multiple times a day, and lots of people are using it, you start to have a trail. And that trail gets more and more ingrained and more and more permanent. But wires together, time. fires together? What, what fires yeah. together, wires together, <laughs> absolutely. And so as that trail starts to, you know, kind of really get more permanent, maybe at some point the park decides to pave it and you have like this great, Whoa. easy travel permanent. road, right? Yeah. And you're going to go that way more often. It becomes much more convenient. And the brain is a bit lazy and it'll always take the convenient option. <laughs> the most wow. it can. Yeah. So that's a very low energy um, sort of expenditure option. So when you're visualizing things and it's, you know, it's not always perfect, but you can definitely start to, that's treading that. It's treading that road. And so to your point, beliefs are very physical things. They're neuron pathways in your brain. It's and chemical, so, it's chemical. I loved that you said that the other day when we were speaking. Yes, beliefs are chemical. Um, they're physical and they're, they're, they're tangible things. We just don't quite have the technology yet to see them like one at a time, right? And so they can be adjusted, they can be changed. And so beliefs and memories and experiences, those neurons can also make a trail, that trail through the forest it could, it lands in destinations and a belief can land in your pain activation centers. It can land in, you know, kind of like the basal parts of your brain that will activate your fight or flight and your immune system, what we call your HPA axis, which has a lot of, of control over in, you know, kind of involuntary things in your body, inflammation or arousal, heart rate. It has a big part in pain as well. So, um, you know, that's the other thing is if you have a belief that activates those locations, you can sort of activate them more often or less often, depending on the pathways you're taking. So that's something to remember, too, is that, you know, even if something is in your hands or your feet or your legs or your back, the activation of how we feel those things does come down to to the brain eventually. Yes. Yes, exactly. You know, could you you've had a lot of background also in um in things like um, addictions. Yes. And, and one of my questions is, you know, people have a lot of difficulty getting off um, SSRIs and things. What exactly is happening in the brain in that area that they sure. find that difficult? Is it because of that access that you're within the brain organisation? Because I know that we've got a number of people that watch us and they have had things like a Valium. I don't know if that's what they call it in America uh, and they can't get off it. So, sure. or, or Ritalin even, you know, we've had people who haven't been able to get off Ritalin. But what, what's happening in the brain that they need, that they've, that they've got that's this difficulty? Good question. Sure. So a large um, part of addiction to anything, whether it's a substance or a behavior or, um, you know, anything else, a lot of times that deals with a chemical in the brain called dopamine, right? And so mm -hmm. the, the neurotransmitters in the brain, it's really hard to say, oh, it's the job of this one to do this. They, they do many things. And sometimes they do, um, you know, things that look like they're competing. Uh, but with dopamine, one way I, it helps me to think of it is a metaphor in addiction is, you know, when I'm talking about those trails from before, dopamine mm -hmm. is sort of like, instead of if you just kind of organically one day at a time kept walking a trail, you brought an army in and you like put a trail down, right? And it usually goes to the pleasure centers of your, you know, it, it creates a pleasurable yes. thing. So it's, it's this pathway to pleasure. And instead of it being something kind of more organic and slowly building, especially when it's a chemical substance, like a medication or even things like alcohol or, or, or drugs, you know, that dopaminergic is what we call it. The, the dopamine punch is so much higher than things you get in your day to day that those pathways get built intensely. Instead of a trail that's gradually built, you've got a, you know, a four lane freeway going okay. through. Superhighway. Yeah. Good yes. analogy. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so when you have anything that affects dopamine, it'll it'll have those issues. And so and unfortunately, even if you can create other roads and trails mm -hmm. to get to places in more adaptive ways, mm -hmm. um, you know, those freeways tend to the ghost of the freeway remains. <laughs> so the, the million dollar question is, isn't the brain ultimately still in control? Can't Are we still the navigator? Are we still the pilot of this body? Even when we're decreasing medication or shifting from an addiction, Tell, talk about that and the possibility sure. and what people might have to do. Yeah. So for me, so the part of the brain that we quote unquote control is actually kind of small. And it's the it's what we call like kind of the prefrontal part of our brain. It's our executive control area. This is things where we um, experience a lot of, of cognitive sorts of processes, right? If you're going into cognitive psychology, um, but there's also something in those parts of the brain that we call metacognition, which is one of my favorite things to study, and it's really something that's become more present in mainstream culture in the last few years as mindfulness has become more important. So you have control over your executive function, but you don't always have control over things that have become automatic. And it's not necessarily that you don't have control. You just don't pay attention to them. You're not giving them a lot of your attentional resources. Those are really valuable currency in our brain and they're limited. So once your brain can automate something, it will. And you have to give it purpose. That's a attention. good line. Once your brain automates something, it will. Yes. Yeah. Your well, brain will always, yeah, yeah always it. takes the road of least resistance, right? And attention is hard. And yeah. so we don't want to spend attention as often as we need to. We want to automate as quickly as possible. And those freeways yeah, yeah, yeah. and those pathways, those are our automation trails. And so now what you can do, it sounds a little bit doom and gloom, right? Like, oh, once the freeway is built, it's built forever. No, not true. Um, so what we can do is start to sort of I don't like to say think of the brain as a muscle because it's not a muscle. And I think that I get really like nerdy about faux science analogies. But <laughs> what we can do is work out our neural pathways a little bit like we would work out a muscle in that the stronger you can make the connections to the kind of, pre, you know, the, the prefrontal parts of your brain, the more control you can have over things. And really what that comes out to is the more awareness you have over your own automations. So yes. automations are very unconscious. So getting back to what I was saying about metacognition. So cognition is things like attention, um, you know, and, and things like trying to initiate an action, being aware of something. Metacognition is our awareness of us doing that, our awareness of our cognition. So what are we thinking about? What do we, what comes up for aware us? of our awareness. We're aware of our awareness. Yeah. So it's you know, becoming aware of what are my automations? When am I like relying on automations and kind of mapping out your own sort of trail map? What are my trails? Which ones are freeways? Which ones are kind of like looking a little scary and we need to go in and clean them up. And so. Okay. Hold on for a minute. Yeah. Why is there such a huge resistance to doing that? Because, I mean, this is what I do in therapy is I yeah. help people to move from their that external belief to an internal belief to be able to look at what's going on within their system. And yet yeah. the massive resistance of it is incredible. Why? <laughs> yeah. So there's a couple of reasons why. I think speaking as somebody who has a bit more of a, of a science and, and a biology background, I'd say it's expensive. Uh, our, our bodies, our brains, we've evolved to, to take, again, the, the least resistance, path of least resistance. When you start to dig into those automations, sometimes those automations are one, they're really deep. And two, they're very, they've become very maladaptive. They're no longer helpful for us. Rose, can we call these the patterns? Like the patterns of people's behavior? Is that the pattern? Sure. Your automatic patterns. Your yeah, mm -hmm. patterns. Absolutely. Some of these patterns are are deep. Sometimes they you You've automated them so much, you don't even know what taught them in the first place. And as you would definitely know this, right, Rose, as a therapist, as you start to dig into the patterns, you start to follow that string back to the memories of what created them in the first place. And they can be very painful, scary. They might require you to learn a lot of new skills. It can be overwhelming. Most of that happens at a very subconscious level. Big of like, T, little T. Big two, yeah. So, you know, a lot of these things are tied back to things that are very inherently traumatic for a person. Um, we build those dopamine freeways can exist, but we also build those freeways 
in times of great fear or trauma. Um, I was telling Rose the other day, uh, we find that the pathways that were created during traumatic times in our lives actually have higher levels of what is called myelin, which is essentially a protective layer of fat around the cells. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, and I was, so I was stunned about that. Yes, it's fascinating. Yes. It's very new research that just came out. And so even chemically, our bodies are putting barriers to changing these things because my God, I almost died. You know, to you, that's what it could be anything. You know, it could be anything yeah. to you, but your brain thought I almost perished. We must never do this a different way again. <laughs> this saved me. I must now do it forever. And I and have there's... to say, I have to interrupt because David um, Hanskin recommends a book in his work called The Talent Code. And The Talent Code is about all these, how, how we change a, a habit and become, we practice something, we become good at it. And the ultimate thing is we have to make a mistake. We have to screw up. We have to mess up to get better. And and it was talking about some of the brilliant musicians and artists, and they were talking about the myelin sheath. Yeah. This yeah. has to do with the myelin sheath. And the funny thing, the myelin sheath, myelin sheath has something to do with MS, which is another thing, but this is fascinating because it's the talent code is, is really talking about that if we can love ourselves messing up, if we can love ourselves learning, if we can love ourselves falling if, down. Okay, if you said, Tova, if. If. Yeah. if. Yeah. And a lot of that, again, and I apologize. I feel like I keep getting distracted on these delightful, interesting paths here, but. Um, no, they're all, so, you're good. You're good. You're, you're completely in, in. So, in, yeah. So that metacognition comes back. That's a skill that's so very important because the more you can be metacognitively aware, even if a pathway is very deep and painful, it helps you to at least have the awareness of like, this is no longer serving me. And that's a hugely, hugely powerful thing. The moment you can really, truly believe yourself, this thing is no longer serving me, you're on the road to a huge, you know, opportunity there. And it yep. takes a lot of work. It's a lot more than just, but I think in therapy, that's that's what we would call a moment of insight, right, Rose? The the, yes. the point of, oh, like suddenly there's this, there's been this like thing right in your uh -huh. peripheral vision for your whole life and you suddenly saw it like, oh my gosh. So metacognition is, is critical. It can actually be built. And so this is why mindfulness practice gets prescribed to people so, so often. Almost in, in our kind of popular media, it's almost too often. We kind of throw it out as a solution to everything. But the reason for that is because meditative practice really enhances that metacognition ability. And to have that really opens up the door to just, again, it's it doesn't solve your problems and it doesn't it doesn't shut down those trails or those mm -hmm. pathways, but it at least gives you awareness of them. It gives you that map of them. And you what, can what change, to doesn't it change them. the brain? Does, isn't um, neuroplasticity sure. what we're aiming for as well? So neuroplasticity is, um, is the brain's ability to make new connections. And it's affected okay. by a few different things. It's a very, again, very chemical process. Um, and there's a few things that impact it. Um, there's a lot of lifestyle things that we know impact it. So, um, a lot of the things that you hear about that are touted as ways to kind of head off dementia um, in older adulthood. Um, so like regular daily exercise, kind of trying to make sure you're learning new things, learning a new language, learning, yeah. learning to drive stick shift, learning to learning, play piano. Yes. <laughs> I always like to say things that itch your brain, but um, you know, whatever you can do to, to kind of put yourself, your yeah, put yourself in a novel situation that is safe, you know, you don't want to traumatize yourself, but you want to put yourself in new situations and find ways to get out of them. Beautiful. Every time you do that, you're building new pathways. You're teaching, you're training your brain to, to build new pathways. So the more often you do that, the easier it will be. Now, again, some of the pathways that are problematic are highly myelinated. And so it will be difficult to change them. And so one of the things that's going to be coming down the road and what we're seeing with a lot of new medications in mental health are things that will help kind of chemically uh, facilitate that process as well. So historically, our mental health medications, you guys brought up SSRIs, they really just kind of change the general levels of neurotransmitters in the brain. They're a little rough, right? They're a little broad. Uh, let's get more serotonin in the brain by not reabsorbing it as quickly, right? That's yeah. largely what we use for a lot of things. But we're hearing, and some of the folks listening may have heard of something called um, clinical psychedelics. There's a lot of interest in this, like, whoa, we can use there psychedelics clinically. Yes. 
And so clinical psychedelics, the reason they're so exciting, they all work in slightly different ways. So there's not like one size fits all. Um, but what a lot of them generally seem to do, their, their mechanism of action, as you would call it, it did, it's a little bit more on that neuroplasticity side um, than it is on a singular change in the brain's environment. It has chemical effects that tend to make the brain a bit more flexible. And they're, again, they're all a little different. And so things like ketamine also have a rapid um, anti-inflammatory response that helps immediately with anti you know, is as an antidepressant effect uh, and decreases risk of suicide very quickly compared to other drugs. Um, so there's other things like that that are a bit separate. Of course, they're all interconnected. It's all the mm -hmm. same medication. But what we're seeing with these psychedelics, no matter what they may be, um, is that they affect that neuroplasticity. And what we've seen in research that came out, oh gosh, it's been a couple years now, that really at the heart of any kind of psychological therapy, whether it's drug therapy or, or psychotherapy, um, we're really getting at that neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. So that is, if it works, it worked because it's helping your brain to become wow. more adaptive and plastic. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited for the future of what we might be able to do when we start to combine neurochemistry, which I am by no means an expert in. So <laughs> I will stop with my, you know, kind of details at, at the point where I can. Um, but neurochemistry and psychotherapy, because not only is that going to really open the door to much more effective mental health treatments, because I mean, imagine Rose as a therapist, if you had a, a, a drug that somebody could take that would make them more neuroplastic while you were doing therapy with them, right? I mean, well, that's, that's exactly what we're doing at the moment yep. with ISTDP. There's a whole group of therapists who are actually, um, um, I think at Monash University here, um, David Spector is involved with that. And I mm -hmm. know in, the, in America, there's some other, um, or maybe in Canada, I can't remember. And I know for our conference in, in, in um, Venice next, oh, this year, um, we're going to have a whole unit on psychotherapy and psychedelics. But I always remember Timothy mm -hmm. Leary, yeah, oh yes. <laughs> and, I always got teased by my colleagues because they always called me the Timothy Leary of our group because yeah. I found this so fascinating. Yeah. And we used to give LSD to our patients. And Whoa. Yeah. 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 That was Whoa. he advocated for LSD. Uh yeah. here in America, a lot of the research has been on ketamine because it's legal, essentially, right? It's an FDA approved. We use it primarily as an anesthetic, but it can be used off-label. And um, it's, it's very fascinating. In my humble opinion, this is still an emerging field. So I am one of many people, but uh, I tend to believe that it's really critical that we use them alongside psychotherapy, yeah. Predictive, yeah. particularly okay. psychotherapy that's really um, dedicated to revisiting mm -hmm. a lot of these old pathways yeah. very purposefully yes. and, and kind of relearning new ways because it opens up and it allows your brain to sort of re-experience these things and create a very strong yeah. response. So yeah. for me, I think it's really fascinating. <laughs> There's, it's not just pairing it, it's critical to pair it with psychotherapy, but then on top of that, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fascinated on research that's being done on which psychotherapies are most effective when paired with it too. So mm -hmm. there's different yeah. techniques and strategies. So Just uh, to add another dimension to that, one of my colleagues, ISTDP therapist is also a recovery room nurse and she mm -hmm. finds that when she does ISTDP, like, you know, what, what are the issues that are bothering you? When a patient comes out of theatre and they're in a, in a huge amount of pain and and the medication that the anaesthetist has offered them doesn't work, Karen will actually move in and even, she says, you know, often the other staff will say, can you see my patient? Can you talk to my <laughs> patient? Because she actually uses, she gets the patient to talk about their feelings and she said it actually comes up post anesthetic in such a way and that's a resource that isn't being noted or been aware of mm -hmm. so i don't know yeah. if that was it's worthwhile to share with you i know that you're beautiful. probably in a slightly different field mm -hmm. yeah so it's the it's the future it's the future where yeah. nurses really are acting like nurses and you find nurses yeah. are you know in, in hebrew it's the same uh, word for sister as nurse Oh, how because lovely. It's, because it's such, and nurses, really nurses are like, you know, so Karen obviously is this amazing nurse. And I'm sure Rose, when you were doing it, you know, you were, you would take the time. It's time. It takes time. It yeah, takes sure. patience. Yes. Takes, but, but I mean, I'm not, I'm really not talking about that. I'm mainly talking no. 
about the fact that the anesthetic has changed the the cognition here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. So when mm. that is shut down, the whole emotional field can come up. Ah, and be depressed. like the defenses are down. You're saying? Yes. It's oh. yes. yeah. It, it is. It's so. Um, and again, um, you know, this is more of a of a theoretical hypothesis that's come out of this, but. There are folks that seem to think based on the way that the drugs affect the brain, what they do is they sort of, uh, I, I guess a way to explain it is that they'll even the playing field on the power of some of your, your neural pathways. And it can make it a little difficult to determine which ones are the really, which ones are the freeways and which yeah. ones are the little paths through the woods. Yeah. Oh, and wow. Yeah. So I, I I wish I could remember exactly which paper I was reading that described this, and I thought it was such a fascinating metaphor. But um, there's there's a and again theory. Uh, this is this is a hypothesis. It's hard to to prove these things, but there's a, a hypothesis out there that the the experience of a psych you know a psychedelic trip is your brain experiencing a, a lack of surety on which path is reality and which one isn't, and they all sort of appear to us as reality. And there's a, an argument that that is kind of the lived experience of your brain becoming extremely plastic because everything is sort of up for grabs. It's really difficult for your brain wow. to establish reality because the way we generally do that right. is based on which pathways are sort of our freeways. Right. What what of our what right. of our experience is really cemented in for us? And um, again, I just I think that's such a fascinating. Well, look, if if, um, if I, I wanted to an answer a few questions in a minute, but if well, there's sure. way there's ways people can can get to their feelings easier because we know that getting to the feelings is is the is the difficult. healing journey so and, and it's difficult and that's a way yeah. like i just met a gentleman who had stage four cancer and he's he did microdosing of marijuana and he still has his cancer but he's living a quality life because he doesn't it's not progressing he's not in pain so if these things can help people live a quality life and, and for that purpose, I mean, I, I just think it's the future, future of, of medicine. Um, it's very, yeah, it's it's most certainly a future. Focusing on these neuroplastic effects is most certainly going to be the future of what we see with with any kind of mental health. But what's great, too, is that what we know about the, the neural ties, like I said, between the brain and body, there's a very good chance that it would also be incredibly helpful for a lot of um, TMS and PPD like symptoms that a lot of folks are are struggling with because it wow. can be really difficult to, you know, put in the work to change those pathways. This would make it just a little easier for folks. So right. fingers crossed. I, I'm yeah, really looking beautiful. Beautiful. So sh sh shalom to all you people. Hi, Scotty and Patty. We see you each week and we just love having you here. And I don't know Sa uh, Safia, but she gave us a nice vote of confidence. So nice to meet you. Is Rose Adams must be your friend because she's calling you B. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Susan, we haven't seen you in a while. And mm -hmm. it's, I, I'm going to agree to this, but she wrote that, isn't this the foundation of Joe Dispenza's work, which he validated with MRIs? I think that's when you were talking about the, um, talking about the, um, uh, the beginning of the, I forget, I lost my train of thought. It might have been. Go ahead. Uh, I'm trying to think, did we talk about, um, oh, right, let's see, oh, did we talk about pain being activated by social and physical? No, no, it was something in the beginning and I said, yeah, it's more the energy work of, anyway, so I'm sure it is, but he validated with MRIs, we'll find that out. And then Robbie was talking about her nervous system and um, top up, bottom down, and just sharing about um, some of her struggles getting off Valium. And then she asked a question, I will bring it up. Um, can you answer, can you address that? Um, about GABA, um, hmm. a bit, you know, so again, neurotransmitters that are very, um, it's, it, you know, to get into their specifics, it can be very complex and very complicated. GABA tends to be an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, and so it can, it can create issues when there's disturbance. Dopamine is one of many chemicals in the brain and it only plays part of the role but GABA most certainly can play a part in this too. And it's been looked at um, and it's, you know, if it is affected, if it's inhibited, um, it can create issues on which pathways are used. So if you go down the freeway, you go down the, the trail, GABA is sort of what, what will 
kind of put a block in that trail and, and stop it down. So it's certainly another neurotransmitter of interest in this field, right. but um, you know, while dopamine is sort of ubiquitous, just it, it, it tends to be very common in how we learn right. and how we lay down those pathways, right. but certainly there's work in, in many of our right. neurotransmitters in these fields. Well, and I'm going to just be tough love about like, it doesn't matter about all those things. It just really matters about, like you said, you said, um, and her next question is asking you, you know, how, how do we, how do we move from the limbic to the prefrontal when the patterns are laid deep? I, my just, I'm just going to answer that from my point of view, since I'm going to finish the, the answer is that we just have to have enormous discipline passion, desire, hope, belief, and continue repetitive. Um, you know, we, we have to really trust our bodies that we our bodies got us here so our bodies can take us somewhere. Like this is a completely really empowering. I mean, all this empowerment, like it's work, like it's, we have to believe in ourselves. Can you talk a little bit about the biology of belief and answer no, to Robin's you, question? Could, okay. we, could we stop for a minute? Yeah. yeah. And and go back to the fact that it's very hard to self reflect. Yeah. And I was actually going to tie that into that. Believe that it doesn't work. They don't. So believe. as opposed to as opposed to so rather than believe self reflect first, but isn't that believing? I would I no. would argue that one thing that you can do that helps a lot with that self reflection is mm -hmm. whatever behaviors you can to get back to that neuroplastic kind of ability. So mindfulness mm -hmm. practice if you can find even it doesn't have to be directly related to your pain but just practicing um essentially sitting quietly and just observing your thoughts non-judgmentally is usually what it'll come down to what goes through your mind what goes mm -hmm. through if you feel something if you hear something what tends to and be what if somebody's in excruciating that? pain because they're focusing on their thoughts well and that can be the case like if you're in pain you know looking at it's, and it can be difficult. It's very distracting. And I don't, I don't doubt that at all. So practicing will be easier during some times and harder during others. And so okay. trying to practice that during pain will be difficult, but That's the more right. you but can practice, is, the easier it gets. Okay. But there also is another opening that we haven't talked about. And that is what's happening with the diaphragm. Because mm -hmm. once you concentrate on your breathing, something happens with the diaphragm and that diaphragm going up and down does something even over the pain can you sure. can you talk about that to a certain well, extent that there's something there's a, is going on there's a lot of tie in between your breath and your vagus nerve and what we yeah. call parasympathetic activation so yes. um, when you think about your nervous okay. system it, it has sympathetic activation which is getting all riled up high arousal and then parasympathetic activation is the contrast the bringing you back down and stimulation of a nerve that comes, it's one of your cranial nerves. So it's one of your major nerves in your brain called the vagus nerve is largely responsible for a lot of your parasympathetic activation. And we found that breath is one of the quickest ways for you to control that parasympathetic activation yes. and, and to uh, activate that vagal, what we call vagal stimulation or vagal nerve stimulation. That's so, right. Amazing. So breathing exercises are more than just, you know, a lot of people have learned to calm you down, right? Oh, just breathe, right? And it's almost so cliche. We don't think about the fact that actually. <laughs> but if you're saying to the brain, breath, if you're saying to the brain, just breathe as yeah. opposed to calm down. Actually, yes. Like, and, and it's hard to do that in but pain. That but makes, yeah. But when you say to a patient, calm down, for example, <laughs> they don't calm down. They calm up. Or right, they, right. they calm up. Yeah. So they usually, usually, there's this. There's this opportunity to be loving and and calm, even in because when do you learn? They say you don't learn it on a yoga mat. You learn when you're in pain. Yeah, you learn in well, and you'll you'll notice your growth in difficult moments. And it's it's one of those things that oozes into your awareness. It's not sharp. It's not a click on or a click off. One day you'll just kind of notice that when you were in pain. You still felt the pain, but you also sort of accepted and were able to focus on other things. Or maybe you had another like kind of rather a minute victory that you can build and grow. And so it's hard sometimes with mindfulness because it's not like a it's not like a weight loss where you can say, like, I want to lose 10 pounds. And you see and you watch and hey, I lost 10 pounds. Like it doesn't work that way. It, it's very difficult. It's to, subtle. It's, subtle, it's very it? subtle. Yes. yes. And so. 
Um, but working through, yes, um, a lot of mindfulness practices will incorporate vagal stimulation and breathing. Um, one really simple um, sort of trick of the trade is your body tends to know it's time to calm down if your exhales are longer than your inhales. And oh, so I a lot like of the that. things that you I learn, like that. box right. breathing and things like that, they're unnatural breathing techniques for danger. So you hyperventilate in danger. When you start to naturally calm down, your exhales get longer. You can sort of activate Let that go. yourself. Yeah. yeah. Breath is, is, is very fascinating because it's one of the only, if not, I believe, the only autonomic process we also have manual control, control over. Yeah. So it's, it's one of the that. only sort of nervous system um, uh, sort of survival functions that we can actively control with our executive part of our brain. So uh, breathing is nothing to be poo-pooed by any means, but um, it does help with that and it can help in the moment, which is why most uh, meditation practices will start with deep breaths, right? You'll yeah, almost always so start with much, deep breaths. I know, there's so much information about the vagus nerve. It's like we, there's so much, and it's, it's it's for the public. It's not for the scientists to really understand the, the power of breathing. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and but, so, oh, yeah, yeah I wanted just, I wanted just to address. So Esther has come to visit us. It's so nice to see you here, Esther. She's involved with IFS internal family systems. She said they've been doing some research on um, psychedelics. And then she said that one of her clients, <laughs> one of her clients suggested drinking a glass of wine before they go into therapy. I mean, what do you think? She wants to know what you think about that. I don't actually know a whole lot about the effects of alcohol on neuroplasticity specifically. I do know that it lowers your inhibitions. So you may be more open to talking about uh, difficult topics without kind of your defense mechanisms, whether that's a function of of enhanced or increased neuroplasticity or something else. I unfortunately don't know the answer to, but that is a an interesting question wouldn't, to address. <laughs> would, wouldn't that also create um, a, um, an inhibitory sort of, um, uh, because pe people who have had a lot of alcohol or drink alcohol a lot, um, actually are quite morose. They're quite, you know, there's, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's something else going on with alcohol yeah. and they have it to distract themselves from their emotions maybe, That's but true. it actually makes their emotions not worse, but it turns the volume down, but it, it turns also the volume uh, down, but it also turns something else up. Oh, well, I was going to say it also turns the volume down on, on cognitive function. So one reason why I would probably recommend against something like drinking a glass of wine before therapy. Now, a glass of wine is a fairly small amount of alcohol, but even yeah. still, it's going to affect and inhibit your memory making capabilities and some of your cognitive function because you'll be inhibited there, too. Yeah. And the point of oh, therapy okay. is to make new roads and to kind of build oh. those new roads. So I again, this is just kind of a response to the question. I, I would want to, to dig into it a little bit more, but I would maybe, you know, kind of push back on that just because you may not be building roads very well yeah, after that. She said she wasn't too keen about it. Yeah, but, I, um, I think your instincts are good. <laughs> Fran has an interesting question, more physical than mindful questions, but do you have any knowledge of with, of, of with low dose naltrexin for pain and secondly, battlefield acupuncture? I never even heard of that. So I don't, um, you know, naltrexone I've mostly experienced as um, more of an opioid. So it's, um, it's what it does is it, it keeps opioids from sort of being able to get into your system. It, it, it blocks the opioids when you do them, which is why it's often a treatment for opioid use disorders. Yeah, um, isn't it a, re a, a, a blocking of the receptor? Yes. Yeah, yes. it's an antagonist. Um, antagonist and right. <laughs> so what it does is it yeah, if, if you think of um, if you think of opioids and and your body's receptors as like Legos, it just goes over the top, <laughs> doesn't let them in, which sounds like it could be great, but it um, can be a little unpleasant, unfortunately. It's so uh, in in the context of addiction, it's tapered into very slowly, because essentially, if you were to give somebody a high dose of naltrexone, whenever they were dealing with an opioid addiction, they would immediately go through uncontrollable withdrawals, which is very, wow. you know, we have to be very careful with that. Now, mm -hmm. as using it for what? pain, withdrawals, withdrawals, because you're essentially going cold turkey, right? Because it's not yes. absorbing, right? Could, um, could we, 
could hold on a minute could we actually go back to robbie's comment about what her nerve she has this feeling of her nerves going all astray yeah, uh, it's not yeah can you see it tova on your yeah, screen yeah yeah it's it's up here when it talks about that her her um her tremors the tremoring with yes, her nerves yeah 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 can you bring that up for a minute yeah. Yeah. because that's appropriate to what we're talking about uh -huh. here's the question you can see it on the side you see the question on the side no, it's not on the side Toby. Oh, that's why it's I'm not asking. here it is it's coming up yeah. now here it is but it's moving down <clears throat> can you see it yeah we can now my okay. nervous system is becoming more and more sensitive top down and bottom up from severe fibromyalgia it is also exacerbated by long time use of benzodiapines that is now that is now trimming more each day. No, it stopped moving. No, here's it goes. Oh, here it goes. Yeah. More each and day. sleep is more disturbed. I have that trail from years of sympathetic overactivity and trauma. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, um, a lot of these things, you know, what's something to consider. One thing that that Robbie mentions here is disturbed sleep. And I think that that's um, use of benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines can most certainly, you know, they are used often uh, in anxiety cases, but they can create issues with just kind of maintaining cycles in the body, any kind of chronic use of medication, right? That it affects those. But sleep is, is here where I think it's important to talk about one of the, the really sinister aspects of pain, I think, is the sleep disturbance. I don't think people realize quite how much that can affect the symptoms of not just pain, but other kinds of issues with the brain and the body. Um, because, you know, what we know is that not just enough sleep, but consistent and healthy sleep cycles are so critical to maintaining functional balance in the brain and the body. And so what happens is that if you don't have, if you have disturbed sleep or sleep behaviors, it will really kind of create a downward spiral on a lot of these things. So what will happen is you'll have a lot more as as your brain is unable to sort of catch its balance. Um, you're going to find that you're in distress and high stress levels more often. And things that are less that maybe were less distressing to you in a healthy state are going to become more distressing to you. And as a result, you're kind of just again, it's kind of one of those downward spirals. So what I really want to encourage anybody to who's who's on the side there, I know pain and sleep disorders are such a common co-occurrence and working again, it's not about getting enough sleep. So trying to get eight or nine hours all the time, but you're bouncing around. It's really about aligning that cycle for your body and allowing it to function at its best because cognitively that will help you. I mean, with so many things beyond pain, but when you're doing things like psychotherapy and you're doing that kind of really intensive work, you really need your your cognitive functioning, your your sort of cyclical function in your brain and body to be at its best. So I highly encourage focusing on that as a priority. I know it's really difficult. There are many different kinds of therapeutic interventions for for sleep disturbance that can help. And sometimes sleep aids can be a little difficult there too, because while again they get you to sleep, but they they affect that cyclical balance they right. they don't always yes. help you get there so there's right. like kind of i don't want to say there's good sleep and there's bad sleep i hate saying it like that that's not really what i mean but like there's just because you slept doesn't mean it was healthy and restful sleep maybe is the way i'm trying to mm -hmm. say it. what you really want to do is get yourself on a schedule that's as consistent as possible because your brain again it needs to automate the things that are important to automate and when you're you're sleeping erratically you can't automate a lot of those wow, things so you're, you're just you're caught yeah. up so i would say that's something just of interest because if there's if there's some symptom severity and worsening a lot of times again sleep is just so ubiquitous and it, i know it's pointed to a lot and sometimes it feels a little bit like well what am i supposed to do and again it's a great thing to work with your therapist on um, because there are many yeah. things you can do yeah yeah, yeah. well see robbie's just said not getting any sleep and haven't for years yeah so, so yeah and you see that's tied up with the fact that she's got this um um nervous sort of feeling of edginess i think you might call it all the time yeah, well, so the, when she, yeah when she dear, rests, she's not actually resting yeah dear rob look she yeah. she i know you know we know dear robbie and she's working so hard and she's doing really well the best she can but she it's scary for her to go to sleep sure because okay. she's anticipating so there's a, there's the audit so there's 
you know, so like, how do you start to tell your brain everything's going to be okay when you've had years of not feeling safe? So yeah. uh, Rose and I have a lot of hope for, you know, Robbie, and we've really been working with her and, you know, Robbie, there is so much hope. There is so much belief. Just You just can't give up. You just mm -hmm. have to have a, a purpose and, you know, see the, see the, I mean, do you have anything else that you can say to, you know, a chronic, you know, losing sleep and, it's it's interesting because it's, it's they have my heart because it's a very mm -hmm. frustrating thing and again it's a huge downward spiral because it affects your cognition and it affects your ability to believe right like your ability to again make those new pathways is deeply affected by sleep or the lack thereof and a lack of getting your body mm -hmm. on that kind of circadian rhythm is what we often will call right, right? your kind of day-to-day -day rhythms right. and so um most certainly again i would just if it's it's not it's not kind of a side symptom of the other things. The other things tend to all be a symptom of that a lot of the time. And so that anxiety, that stress, a lot of that may be coming from your body working overtime and trying to get itself going. And it just doesn't know, it, it kind of, it can't predict. It's predicting and it doesn't, it doesn't just doesn't know yeah. what to do. So it, it can create intense feelings of anxiety for sure. Could you, could you address the, um, the fact that maybe what what if somebody this is just you know what if somebody just could let go and accept the situation what if somebody could just somehow you know they say there's books like i've read like you don't rather than want sleep try to create like you want to create you don't want want you don't want to have the expectations like you know buddha says like what do you say to that is that am i is that just woo woo when i say to people just you just have to let go and fold into it like, is there anything about that with somebody who's just chronically not getting sleep and, and so, you know, cognitive distorted? I think that there's a cognitive aspect in the moment of, of disturbed sleep where you're very fixated on the fact that you cannot yeah. sleep and really yeah. want to. That's and the I think problem, that's, isn't it? It's that yes. fixation that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So you start to have what we um, kind of give you a $5 word of perseverative thoughts, but like, you know, intrusive thoughts almost, but like you're sitting there just over and over playing, okay, you know, playing and playing and you're just, yeah, fixated on it. Now, um, again, there are things that can be done um, that can help with that. And I know like in the moment it can be very difficult, but I know I've had uh, colleagues who recommend things like, it's, it's really, again, about finding that cycle and getting yourself back into it that will help incredibly. And so consistency throughout your day, consistent times, you know, kind of routines will always help. And then sometimes I know there are quite a few doctors I've worked with who will kind of put you on a sleep deprivation for a minute, get you back into the cycle, make sure you're going to sleep at the right times and kind of get you back into that routine. So things like that can be very important. But it's I think to think of sleep not as a, an event, not as a thing, like a once off, but it's, it's your entire sleep wake cycle and how balanced oh, that can smart. be. But um, yeah, and as far as acceptance, I think absolutely it gets back to, I maybe not even acceptance, but again, kind of, if you wanna take that metacognitive approach, it's looking at, again, not just, am I asleep right now? Should I be? <laughs> um, but what do I, what's a, what's a day in my life look like? What does a 24 hour pocket look like? Is it depends day to day? Do I have anything consistent? Did I? Did I run? Do I tend to run in, in weird patterns? Am I up, down, mm -hmm. up, down? Am I napping and then kind of mm -hmm. trying to catch up? So mm -hmm. I think taking it as an observation. Um, one of the things I think the pathway to acceptance is just curiosity. Take yeah. a look at what you're doing. Take a look at your day and don't judge it. There's no shoulds. There's no goods. There's no bads. It's just it, what it is. And just take a look at it and just observe it and see what it looks like and i suspect mm. poor robbie I, I i'm so sorry for you to have mm. sleep disturbance for years is such a frustrating issue mm. but i think those are things you can you can take to someone to help out and just don't think of it so much as how do i sleep better but how do i rebuild that that rhythm for myself yeah amazing advice body. yeah amazing could advice I, could I just move to another area that's of great interest to me personally as a therapist and that is about the ro the role of guilt in our lives and sure. early guilt um what what's the neurocognition about that oh guilt is a very powerful thing um yes so i would say it it ties in very much to fear and how we respond so it's a big fear element um 
one thing that people don't realize in neuroscience that we're, we're learning more and more of is, is how much social harms are truly harmful. And so when you have guilt is essentially our evolved way of learning that you've done something socially completely unacceptable. And again, subjective, you may have done something totally fine, but there's something built into you that teaches you based on consequences, whether it was okay or not. But we learned, we, we learned from another psychologist, which I thought was very clever, that ultimately you didn't do it on purpose. Oh, of was, course not. Innately, you're innately, you're good, your goodness. Yeah, when, right you up. never do it on purpose, right? You just, and you learn through consequences, usually when you're very young. And so when you, it's kind of interesting because guilt and fear and these, these social wrongs, um, one of the things I think is fascinating, social pain, social rejection and social isolation, the things we're trying to avoid with things like guilt, those are activated or they activate the same parts of the brain as physical pain. So uh, a social hurt, is the same to your brain as a physical one in a lot of there's a lot of crossover there physically and so okay, can you talk you... about that a bit more uh, sure can, yeah dig into that a bit more because it's an important um role in in people with chronic pain because there's this sort of sense of guilt but that it's not hooked to anything because with guilt if we've hurt someone we will want to make restitution but this guilt is something deeper and there's no restitution and it's sort of like it's floating around there in the in the um in the corpus callosum so to speak mm -hmm. you know can you just draw that out a little bit more for our audience because it's never really spoken about very much but it's a very important part of healing absolutely yeah so you know again i i find that when you study things from a neuroscience from a biological perspective stigma washes away because so much of what we do is is just such an obvious chain of events <laughs> you know and it's just such an obvious biological thing so talking about pain there's a, a part of the brain the insula um a lot of times it's referred to as the pain center imaging studies will find that it activates in pain and studies a few years ago found that when you have a social isolation or a social painfully you know painful social incidents uh it activates as well so those two things wow. are, are are physically similar so oh, when you Bethany, talk about I love you. <laughs> this and is so, so true i see this clinically and all the so time pain and pain is an emotion pain, so is, pain an emotion. is an emotion so, absolutely yeah it, it really ties into that and it i always found it really funny because when i would talk to um some of my colleagues about this because sometimes it was like a little woo -woo, like really and i'd say what do you say when someone goes through a really bad breakup What's the first thing that's out of somebody's mouth? Ouch. Oh, that must hurt. Ouch. I'm so sorry. We wow. use pain language all the time. And we, it's, it's not, that's by no means scientific data, but it's a funny anecdotal pattern that people, you know, kind of yeah. do. We use pain language for social pain all the time, social hurt. But what it gets to is, yeah, you're going to have, so in the same way that people with chronic pain are tend to be physically protective, you tend to be, you, you start to become less physically active and you start to protect yourself for fear of, of physical pain. Guilt in many ways is the social version of that. If you start to feel guilt for things, it's a protective mechanism for not doing them in the future. Now, is it adaptive? Well, short term, maybe it is. You know, I don't wanna do that. Oh, I feel guilty about that. But over time, it's not a good long-term strategy. And the guilt's build up in the same way that avoiding physical activity is often very counterindicated. You know, you don't want to, because then your, your muscles start to atrophy, you start to lock up, you start to have less physical health. And so the guilt is sort of that mental side that you could think of as where you're insulating yourself from the potential of that social side of pain. So in the same way that we protect ourselves physically, we use guilt to protect ourselves mentally, even if it feels like a, a free floating guilt or a guilt you can't explain. Well, you see, that's, yeah, well, that's the guilt that... Uh oh, Where theory. You? We, we would see that as part of, you know, if if you respond in the way of your, the way your carer has responded to you, you'll get thrown out of the nest. Yeah. So you're guilty about being angry with them, for example, and that and that neurochemistry, it it, it I don't know, it, but it it just must be so activated all the time because the pain and that are so connected, 
but it takes weeks and weeks and, and hours of therapy to actually join it all up so that it makes sense for people. Oh, and sure. Yet, and yeah. yeah. Well, it's an avoidance it's therapy real. or a, it's an avoidance strategy, right? Guilt. It, yes. It's to avoid something. So yes. um, anytime you're doing therapy to address an avoidant strategy, it's, it's extra painful and difficult because it was put oh, yeah. there not to poke. Yeah. <laughs> That's it was, right. it, you know, it, it's not meant to be addressed. And you've you've kind of put that in there. And if you've put it in there in ink in your brain, if you've got a lot of myelin around it, it's something where that avoidance is very, it can be very difficult. It is not impossible to change the brain not, chemistry around it, but yeah. it will be difficult. And, yeah. and wow. that's, that's, that's the amazing. And talk, talk again, I've heard this before and I, I'm getting more comfortable understanding it. And I love, I love our listeners to hear it. The pain is processed in the same place that emotions are processed? Well, so pain acts a lot like an emotion. There's no space where an emotion is processed. Uh, that's okay. a that's a bit of a myth. They've been looking for the, the oh, anger okay. centers, the sadness centers. Yeah, the there's, brain. well, in, in a way it is. So think of, okay. of emotions not as specific instances, but what they are is they're very unique blendings. The hindbrain is most certainly involved because a I always like to, to use this, this kind of analogy. It's a recipe. Emotions are, are like a recipe. And the ingredients are the physiological, what we call um, your, your inner reception, which is your body's physical sense of the inside of itself. So if you have butterflies in your tummy, or you can feel that your, um, your, your chest is tightening, those are interrecepted cues, right? You're feeling inside of yourself. It tends to be a very non-specific sensory experience because if you could feel your spleen the same way you can feel your pinky finger you'd probably go insane if you could be like oh my left kidney itches like you'd lose your mind so we don't usually feel it very specifically it's kind of a broader sense of how we're functioning um so that and that is generally processed a bit in the hindbrain that's where a lot of our kind of uh, kind of physiological signals because those are critical. We need to have that life support system going all the time. That needs to be very automatic. If our executive function was in charge of that, we would have died a long time ago. We're not that good. So <laughs> those are a lot of automatic processes. And that's where you get things. Um, your hypothalamus is involved in a lot of that. And so we, we talk about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis. That is all kind of how your body will regulate arousal and it, it regulates many things. Um, so anyway, there's the physical ingredient. And then there's the cognitive kind of mental ingredients. And that's usually your memories, your experiences, your beliefs, the things that the roads you've built in your brain that are tied to those feelings in your body. And then the last is the social context outside of you. What are your other sensory organs telling you about who's around you? Where are you? Is it dangerous? Is it new? Is it safe? That's so all cool. those things come together and we all feel them so often and there's patterns in them that we name them emotions and that how you're feeling, that's an emotion. So high arousal with beliefs around I've been, my boundaries have been crossed and I you know, didn't get what I deserved with context of a person who's done this to you before in a situation where you expected something that you didn't, you're going to feel anger. You're going to feel, you know, irritation or frustration, depending on who you are, all those things sort of blend together. It's a lot like colors on a spectrum. You know, yes, there's blue, but on a spectrum, where does blue end and green begin? You know, like drawing that line can be a little tough. Mm -hmm. So emotions are very broad. So pain, uh, one of the things I've, I've, used to use as a mantra with one of my old study groups, a pain is an emotion. When I say that, I mean, it has the same three ingredients. So there's a the physiological part and it could be nociception, which is the pain version of interoception. Um, there's nerves that are specially trained, you could say designed to carry pain signals to the brain. So if you have acute pain, then there's nociception, but sometimes it could just be plain old garden variety interoception butterflies in your stomach, right? Chest, you know, tightening of the chest, tightening of your muscles, a general tension. There's beliefs, there's the expectations, those predictions that your brain has already laid down based on your past experiences or what you've been told or what you've seen yourself. And then there's the context of the world around you. Where are you right now? And so that's things that can be triggering, um, things that be, can be calming. So all those things kind of work together. So while no susception 
the process of those nerves carrying information to that, you know, to the insula of your brain is a physical process. Pain is a complex aspect that is very different for everyone that has very different components, memories, beliefs, yes. social, social aspects. So when we talk about pain, really, as humans, we're really talking about an emotion of pain, not a simple physiologic process. Could I just add to, to this mix? Um, you know, from a nursing perspective, you go to a patient. Oh, no, I'm not. Say that, can you repeat that again? Yep. For Sunny. Yeah, you'll go to a patient who's yeah. maybe awake at night and, uh, oh, have you got any pain? And they'll say no. But you can see absolutely that they're full of pain, but they've denied it. And, and you know, we sort of see that as being stoic. But it's not really because the face, the eyes, the whole demeanor of the person's body says that they've got a lot of pain. What What's happening there? Good question. Sure. Yeah, you can deny the same thing we deny anger. A lot of people are trained to think of that as an emotion you're not mm. allowed to have, sadness. Um, yeah. We talk about that in, in psychological components all the time, the, the shame around emotions and that there are good emotions and bad emotions. Pain is largely, for a lot of people, a bad emotion. And in yeah. Western culture, we're taught you need to be tough. And we construe grit, which is like a high resilience, the ability to bounce yeah. back from things, with this idea that we don't actually feel the pain or the harm or the sadness or the initial trauma at all. And that's they're two very different things. You can yeah. feel pain and be very tough. I mean, you you kind of have to feel pain in order to be tough. You have to bounce back from it. And so yes. I think in the same way, people will deny bad emotions um, and mm. need to learn how to overcome that habit through therapeutic assistance. We we can deny pain uh, in the same way just because there's this mm. assumption that it's that it's bad or weak. Um, unfortunately, yeah. there's this understanding. So it's a mindset, isn't it? It's, it's a, a mindset. mindset. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it, it ties into our beliefs so strongly. Yes, yeah, that's really lovely. And as you were speaking, I thought with the military, for example, oh, they gosh. deny pain completely, don't they? Oh, absolutely. Well, because there's this idea, again, especially, you know, my experiences with the Western, you know, military, the American military, you, you have to be tough and you have to be strong, you have to be fearless and you have to be indestructible. Um, and so, absolutely, uh, there's a lot of this. Um, the story I was you know, kind of telling you guys earlier, there's a feeling that you can't feel scared or anxious or stressed. And what we see is that, of course, people feel highly aroused and, and stressed. And that's the body's natural, healthy response. But where we saw the most issue were people who would have those responses and then report verbally to us that they were fine. I'm fine. I have no level of stress right now, whether because they're so out of touch with it or what is more likely to be correct. They're just afraid of the stigma of being honest there because there's this belief that you can't be yeah. stressed, which is a similar thing to pain, right? There's arousal. Yes, that's, uh, that's, that's a physical thing. To make. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah. just in the same way. Stress is an emotion in the way that we discuss it too, because it's more than just physiological arousal. That can be excited. It can be anxious. Mm -hmm. It can be scared. It can be thrilled. Um, all of those things use that physiological arousal. It's the filters that we put over it and the filters right, of our environment. See, in in the denying the pain, you've created a conflict. You have. And yeah, the there's brain a lot of reacts to that conflict. Okay. But I, I want to turn I want to turn that around now. Okay. So that so that we see that the the being tough to get over the pain isn't the solution. That's right, where I'm trying to come from. Yeah, right. in the same way that blocking something is never yes. the solution, right? Yes. To resolving it, you have yes. to accept it to resolve it. You yes. have to you understand have to soften, it. Soften your right. understanding of your suffering, of that Absolutely. physical bodily suffering. Right. Yeah, and I think and what, that's a very yeah. important component of people with chronic pain because they want to be tough on themselves and get over it. And they say to you, yeah, but um, you've talked to me for four sessions, you know, but that's only four hours. But they've yeah. had the pain for 40 years and they want yeah. to be over it in four hours. Well, it doesn't exactly. work like that. Exactly. Well, and you've probably been told, depending on your cultural background, that you need to be tough your entire life. So you're yes. going back 
not just on your yes. pain that you may have had for 40 years, but beliefs you've been brought up with since infancy and childhood, you know? Um, yes. You know, you may how, have many of us, how many of us were told being sensitive was wrong and weak, and now sensitive is the new strong? It's the new thing, yeah. There's so <laughs> much that, that it, we don't even think of as, you know, you probably don't even think of it as abnormal because it's just how you were brought up. It's your it's a freeway that's so just powerful in your brain. You don't think it, it's so automatic. Yeah. You don't it's even so think about it. You don't even consider other roads because of course that's the way. Mm -hmm. Of course I take, you know, the 80 to get home mm -hmm. to California whenever I'm driving. Like mm -hmm. I'm not, what other mm -hmm. roads are there? I don't know. I could drive off the road and just drive through fields. Yeah. Well, so you don't think about alternatives because yeah. you're just so habituated that yeah, belief. Yeah, it's that habituation, isn't it? Yes. But also, um, the alternatives often, if you think about childhood, for example, and mm -hmm. often our suffering is all is from our childhood, you know, that small t trauma. Yeah. If you go off the road, you're going to get into trouble. And that <laughs> yeah. then becomes... No, it's a dead end or something, isn't it? Right, yeah. So a lot of the things, there's a lot that go on that goes on in childhood. Um, when you're a child, your brain is primed for building these freeways quickly, very rapidly, much more differently than we are as adults. The plasticity and the available neurons that you have in infancy and childhood are much wow. different. They're set up different. They function different. So the developing brain kind of slowly becomes less and less plastic. You never become not at all flexible, but you become less flexible. And that's on purpose because the brain needs to learn critical things early and really quickly. pop them in there. So it, it quickly puts yeah. things in there and it writes it in ink fast. So it's yeah. really easy for things to be, I mean, you know, for lack of a better word, it can act like a trauma, but it's not maladaptive. So for example, touching a hot stove is an example we've all had. Everyone probably had an, you know, a situation in their very young childhood where they tried to touch a hot stove. And you have multiple factors that come into here. You have probably a, a parent figure who expresses genuine fear, which always scares a kid, right? Like, oh my gosh. So they, no, 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 no. You can't do that. That's bad. Like a lot of those factors. And then on top of that, your brain is literally set up to like, okay, never do this again. <laughs> like This is yeah. bad. And that's very adaptive. That's all of these things that occur technically sure. are very adaptive. They can just go a little sideways on us sometimes, but we can use the same processes to write them back. Very up, few so. people get up in the morning and don't brush their teeth. It's just exactly. Automatic. And I always You've say, automated that's, you're not negotiating the teeth, so don't negotiate your mindfulness workout, you know? <laughs> exactly, you gotta create it. I, I wanna say, well, I just wanna welcome Cheryl, who came on late, Cheryl LaRue, and um, uh, Patty Clark, who, I just, we have very many courageous people that come to our show and ask questions and many are on their healing journey. And um, I know Rose and I feel just blessed to be part of this, but before I get all teary eyed, I want to just ask a quick question. This is something I would think, and I would like to hear your scientific backgrounds. Maybe this could help Robbie. If somebody's relaxing and calming their brain and calming their anxiety, and they're not sleeping, but they're relaxing. Is that the, can the body benefit from that? Can we, can we count that as rest? We can't Whether count it as sleep, right, but okay. we can count it as rest. Okay. So sleep has, sleep's kind of a, a fascinating mystery. We don't still know a whole lot about how sleep works to recharge and reset our rhythms in the brain. There's lots of things that go on that we're still, there's a whole field, right? That sleep scientists are looking into both physically, mentally, um, however, that quiet time to rest usually correlates with safety. And when you have a history of, of anxiety and trauma, you're giving your body a moment to mindfully be aware that you're safe right now. One of my favorite things for me personally, when I do mindfulness practice is to have something that guides me to pay attention to the fact that I have nowhere to be right now, nothing to do, no one that needs me. And I can kind of rest in that moment. Wow. And even just that, if you're very chaotic and you have a day that's kind of go, 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 just it's not having the rest, but it's also being very aware of it and just really just kind of telling yourself in that moment, I am safe. I am OK. And having those quiet, restful moments can be incredibly valuable because that awareness now creates sometimes I'm safe 
as a pathway. And the more frequently and consistently you practice that feeling and then really yes. reflecting on it in the moment, I am safe right now. Then when your brain is having a moment where it's really anxious, it likes to do black and white thinking and it'll, it'll convince you I'm never safe. The world is a dangerous place and I'm always in danger. And you can call back and say, nay, nay, I know I am sometimes safe. I have been safe. I'm safe every day at three o'clock during this or whatever it may mm -hmm. be or however you want to give that to yourself. But it, while it's not the same as sleep, it has a very valuable role in not only calming down your body through parasympathetic activation, but also building a new safety pathway in your brain. You want to convince your, your brain can be a little bit of a drama queen. And it does, especially when it's under stress and duress. If you're sleep deprived, you're anxious, you're frustrated, it will always be a drama queen. And you've got to kind of tone it down, take the diva down. And you need to remind <laughs> it that it's not always this way. It's not always going to be this way because your brain, that black and white thinking is a very common energy saving approach that oh, your brain absolutely. turns on. So think of it as like the energy saver on your refrigerator. If you're stressed all the time, then your kind of brain is the equivalent of a, a sort of just lukewarm refrigerator. <laughs> it's not dead. It hasn't turned off, but it's not really doing a great job either. But um, black and white thinking and all those kinds of like catastrophic thinking are very common. Um, and that kind of practice will help break them down. It gives you the proof you need for yourself. Wow. Beautiful. Just beautiful. And you really- it gives you the proof. I missed that. It gives you the proof. Oh. It gives you the proof you need for yourself. So your brain has those experiences now and it can draw mm. on them. So it's it's proof mm. that, hey, it's not always like this. You know, it's there are safe times. Yes. But, sure, doing but the it, catastrophizing um, when it's yeah. sort of like, I, I wanted to ask you about that loop, that catastrophizing loop. Sure. Can, can you talk, sort of talk about the neuroscience of that? Because, you know, it, it's sort of like I'm in danger. I've got fear. This fear has um, is going to create that in me, so I, I I catastrophize about it all, and it just doesn't stop. It's like no, it doesn't. So catastrophizing or any kind of anxious thinking, um, it kind of gets back to what I was saying OCD about how the brain predicts. Well. Yep, OCD yeah. as well. Um, when the brain predicts, um, it could activate things. So the brain is able to activate your stress and fight or flight responses in the absence of any danger if it thinks danger is coming. If it, yes, that's how you that's stay alive, right? That's, yes. I smell an enemy, you know, if I smell a danger, I'm going to run away because I know it's tied to it. But of course we aren't running away from animals and we have different kinds of dangers now. And so when you have anxious thoughts about things, you can activate it. And so even the fear of something hurting catastrophizing can cause pain and it will most certainly amplify pain in any kind of a physical encounter. Um, a good example, even outside of pathology is whenever a child gets a shot, a person gets a shot. I always say a child, but frankly, this is adults too. You, you usually don't want to, you want to do it while you've got them distracted. Talk to them. You don't want to sit there and be like, okay, one, two, three, go. Like if they know it's going to come and they think it's going to hurt, it'll hurt more. If you can catch them distracted and you get them talking about something else and you do it, oftentimes the pain doesn't register for us at all, right? Exactly. We're all kind of getting COVID shots right now. So it's probably like a particularly like eh, cringy thing, but um I kind of wish they did it better for adults too. Like mm -hmm. give me talking about something and then give me the shot. Don't just like <laughs> jam it in there. But um <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so when you have that catastrophic thing, your anxiety about the pain can then actually activate the pain, right? The feelings of pain or the the feelings of tension, the intercepted cues that you personally have associated with pain. So whenever you, you tighten that up, those feelings of arousal in your brain and for the, the brain of a person who has any kind of chronic pain condition, that is likely to arouse the pain center of your brain. It's just a tight freeway. It's an automatic thing. I think for me, the way you break a lot of spirals um, is just really focusing a lot of that. And again, I, I have a cognitive bend, <laughs> but if you can ma maintain presence, present moment awareness, I am okay right now. I am safe right now. Nothing is going wrong. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about the past. But if you can ground Other yourself in a present, yeah. Other than react. So, and that's where, again, the breathing, I think is very helpful. It's a very grounding activity. It brings you to where you are right now. I'm sitting here. I'm talking to you. There's no one chasing me. There's no reason to be scared. There's no one to come. And it really does. It, it's, it's a practice of shifting your perspective 
so that you aren't worried about a possible threat. And it, again, it's practice, practice, practice. Mindfulness comes up a lot. Mindfulness is a practice. And so these things won't work the first time you try them most of the time. It's That's something right. that slowly They, they won't work for weeks usually. Yeah. 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 And, <laughs> and often I say for patients to actually um, put the timer on their phone if they're doing breathing so that they're not thinking, oh, it's nearly over. So, yeah. you know, do it five minutes today, right. maybe five minutes for a week, then bring it up to seven and ten. You know, I've got another question, and it's a clinical question, and it's it's like a health one, I suppose. But, you know, a patient would come and, and say, I've got this terrible pain in my shoulder, and it will turn out that they've got cholecystitis. Tell me about referred pain. Or they'll tell you they've got a pain in the middle in midline of their stomach, and you palpate them in the left iliac fossa and you find that they've got appendicitis how does that work so this is something i actually um i would most certainly say i am a, a student more than an expert but i've learned a lot from howard schubner who i got to work with on some projects about the difference between structural <clears throat> excuse me structural pain something broken in the hardware and then what we call top, what i like to call top down pain or something going on with the software um, and they actually do act differently and so it's it's very important to make sure we don't ever start with a diagnosis of top-down pain. You always want to make sure that there's nothing structurally wrong with someone. The problem Ooh. comes from whenever a doctor doesn't find anything structurally wrong, but still perpetuates the idea that there's something structurally wrong with you and moves along that, even though they have no idea what it might be or evidence for it. But one thing Howard taught me about pain in those situations is that if the pain is very specific, unmoving and constant, a lot of the time it is going to be related to a very specific unmoving and constant hardware issue, structural issue. So True. if it's very localized and it's it's always there, it doesn't really change based on you know environmental conditions other than maybe poking it or something. But um, however, what most people experience in a lot of chronic pain situations is a more diffuse pain. It tends to um, be much more present in stressful situations or tied into more emotional arousal. And it can move around the body, it can mirror itself, it hops around or it's large swaths of the body. Um, and so those are often signs that there's a very good chance it's a software issue. It's a top down pain that needs to be treated in that way as opposed to a bottom up way. So uh, again, not a physician. So again, more of a, a, a student of this than an expert, but that's yeah. that's was a very fascinating learning for me is that um and then the other is just that you, you know, know you, we know that but what what yeah. oh I was, go ahead but what i'm fascinated with is the fact that you could have cholecystitis and you won't have a pain there in your abdomen you'll have a pain up here in your shoulder oh i get what you're saying or so when it, you've when got it's it, you're having a cardiac problem and your face is cold your yeah. arm is numb. Why is so, that? So that I think is really interesting is it makes me wonder when we have a history of, of these chronic kind of brain body issues, I think that it starts to affect that our ability to perceive those interoceptive things or how our body and brain are reacting to it. And so I think there's a very good chance that what would happen is your your body is so used to feeling an interocepted feeling inside your body and it sets off something, but your pathway to what it sets off or what is the symptom that you experience might be strangely like paved in a weird direction. You may have, you know, just through consistency paved it in an opposite direction. Um, so it's very possible that, yeah, people may have, especially they have a history of chronic sort of mind body symptoms when they do have an acute injury or something that's oh, intercepted, it's very <laughs> possible that it'll, go with skills. Yes. Yeah. And you see, that's the problem with diagnosing patients. If you think about it, the patient comes with this um, a, a cholecystitis, you know, the gallbladder is inflamed, mm -hmm. but the physician or the, or the, you know, the, uh, like ED nurse or whatever, doesn't ask them what other pains have you got? So what I've just realized is, that we're actually looking at a TMS type symptom that's telling us about the pain somewhere else. Like it's the inflammation is there, but the pathway is is um, it's specific 
it's always specific. They've always got that cold feeling in their neck. They've always got that numb feeling down their arm. But then nobody asks them, you know, have you got other problems? But not, yeah. like, I mean, all of those things we've got to deal with at the time. You know, if they've got cholecystitis, we've got to do something about it. We've got to get them to the doctor or, yeah. you know, um, abdo pain and it's in, in the right iliac fossa. You've got to get them to the doctor to have their appendix out or whatever. But we actually don't ask the bigger picture of these same patients, do we? Exactly. And I think that's yeah. that's a huge issue in medicine more generally. That's something that I'm very fascinated by is the idea that we are systems. We are not ever in a vacuum and our body parts are not in a vacuum. They all function as part of a system and that system has a history and it has. And it's you know, not a it's science. Not it's not a science. No. I don't think it's, it's a practice. It's an art. It's an art. It's an art. Yes. It's an art. And so I, I think it's fascinating. It brings to mind to me the idea that we studied heart attacks in men for so long. Um, that we didn't realize that women can have you know, different subjective experiences of a heart attack. Yeah, but we yeah, had only, yeah, yeah, we had only ever studied the self-reported subjective symptoms from men. And when women would have heart attacks, and they still do today, right? They go into the doctor and they don't report the expected symptoms, or they report them differently. No, women are report, sent home often. Yeah. Oh wow! They report a stomach feeling, but you mm -hmm. see that the, in the vasovagal system, the, the heart and the and the uh, stomach is in the same um, pathway, nerve pathway, but that isn't actually recognized. And, mm -hmm. and of course, many, many women die. They've been to the doctor, oh, wow. but they haven't actually been able to tell the doctor in his mm -hmm. terminology wow. what, what the problem is. They'll complain about a stomach problem. And, you know, I've noticed that people with who have a, 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 a bypass surgery or whatever, they'll say to you, you know, I don't get reflux anymore. <laughs> yeah or I've, I've been able to go off my my uh, 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 uh what do you call it inhibitors uh, my um i can't think of the name of them now yeah the, because they've had they've had the um the, the stent done and and the heart flow the flow to the heart is better so the the body isn't actually reacting to the fact that the amazing it's amazing it comes back into homeostasis yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. for some you know what i think is fascinating now i'm going to open up a can of worms so i probably i don't know if i should but you know for some people homeostasis is uncomfortable um because they've been out of oh, it for so long and definitely. so you'll see definitely. that a lot of the times and so um so that's just something to note too when it comes to the body and it comes to function it's really about novelty and familiarity more than it is about an objective right or wrong good or bad when it when it comes to your subjective experience of that thing so if, mm. if being healthy and having strong function is novel to you your brain can still kind of take that in as a threatening experience novelty in certain you know if we're not prepared for it we don't feel like we're at our best novelty will always sort of hit us as a threat our amygdala tells us it's oh my God. A threatening yes. thing, so. Look, the defense the defense like once you one like in therapy for example you you set up a, a, a safety mechanism for a patient and then all of a sudden the defenses just shoot up you know <laughs> am i really safe with this person they there's got to be something the matter with them that they're being uh, uh, open to me and that they want to know about me and the defenses you know the defiance comes up uh or or the yeah. or the um compliance you know they sort of like go passive or the intellectualizing especially with somatic pain people the intellectualizing go comes up because someone's interested in them all of a sudden so there must be some danger right. that this person Point. could really want to know about me and mm. bang up comes the wall it's just that's incredible. That's a point I think I really want to drive home for people who experience these issues is that for you, when you've experienced this ongoing feeling of, of pain and danger, um, you know, it's a very good chance that novelty of any kind will will feel scary. Newness will feel scary. And oh, yeah. uh, getting Definitely. back to, you know, the more you practice with that neuroplasticity and exploring growth in your brain, if you're living a lifestyle um, that enhances that. So there's, I mean, pretty much the basic things your doctor is telling you to do all the time, right? Healthy diet, 
and good sleep and, and moving around and moving balance, your body every day. Balance. Actually Hitting balance. that balance. So I don't have any major secrets to that. Yeah. Um, making sure you're doing something interesting and pleasurable every day. But right. the more you practice that, the less that novelty will feel scary to you. So the more your brain will be comfortable with novelty and feel confident that it can address it. But in the absence of that, if you're not used to exposing yourself to new pleasurable things often, as you get better, it can subjectively feel bad. And so that's Dangerous. something to kind of, yeah. Wow. So I like to tell people, just make sure you're, you're tying in, do something lovely, do something new and fun as often as you possibly can. Try and do something pleasurable and new every day. And it'll really yeah. help whenever you experience these changes, you, you'll be surprised at how quickly your brain goes, oh yeah, new things are fine. Absolutely. New things are good. <laughs> Yeah, new and again, those words, new, good, bad, are just words. You know, the word stress is is just means pressure. It's not a negative or bad word. It's just a word that we've given enormous power to. This word stress. You yes, know? we're very afraid of it, um, so but also make, weirdly empowered by it. <laughs> yeah, you would make a wonderful therapist. Oh gosh, you would. You would probably. And you are. We're all. You're, you're, you probably are ther doing therapy. Oh no! 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 You no, 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 no. <laughs> you like being kind of telescope. Yeah, we you know, probably, funny, I, I just love to poke at things. And I, I really am just very fascinated at how things work. I always have been. And it was one of the first things my graduate student advisor told me my first semester of graduate school was, yeah. you don't want to be a clinician, do you? And I was like, no, no, I'm in the research program. They're like, okay. <laughs> 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 well, I just, are um, you traumatized by that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in a good way. Okay. I feel like it sent me off in my white, my my lab coat and rat lab ways. So, well, but. it's more it's morning for Rose and afternoon for yes. you. And I wish I had more energy. Maybe you two want to stay on for a couple more hours. <laughs> but I, yeah, go ahead, Rose. Yeah, sorry, I I just want to mention that Bethany has got a lovely saying on the back of her email. Could you <laughs> say it slowly? Because it's it's sort of like a bit of a tongue twister. Could you say it slowly for everyone? Because it's what a scientist is. Yes. And, and the reason I bring this up is because, you know, we've got to see ourselves as our own scientists. And we've got to see it as one of the therapists says, you've got to go in the back door. You've always shown been shown the front, show everyone the front door, but you've got to allow someone to come in the back door and see how the mechanism works. And this yeah. is what Dr. Bethany Raines does every single day. So please go slow, <laughs> put a pause in that, and let everyone know say, where you come from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's a quote I found while I was in graduate school, and it is that research is to see what everyone else has seen. Research is to see what everyone else, else, has, else seen, has seen and to think what no one else has thought. To think what no one else, else has thought. Has yes. Thought. And that's what I that. ask my <laughs> patients to do every single day that I sit with them and talk to them or get them to talk, is to see their lives from a different angle, a curious Search angle. To see what everyone else has seen and to think. What so this, no is, this is not what, this is, this, is, this is more like the art of, this is more like the art. This is more like the unfolding. This is very creative. This is very- it's the the philosophy of science, I did not come up with it. Uh, it's a Hungarian biochemist. His name is Albert St. Georgi. Um, and he, he is famous for saying this. And it's wow. something that I, I found very just- um, It's so appropriate. Yes. For us, all of us, in every single way in our lives, in our, in our marriage or, or relationship situation, with our, with our children's situation, with our work colleague situation, everything. Yes. Well, it's it, to be curious about the average. Yeah. That you put yeah. that together. Be so curious in, in, about in our, your life. In our, in our closing, I want to say that I want you to watch All the Rage. And yes. then we're going to have <laughs> you back in a few months with Michael Galinsky, who's the star and the director, who's met Sarno and brought Sarno. Really, Michael Galinsky is amazing. And I think the four of us could have a really funny discussion because you you just make you make science like I, I would – 
smile my way through chemistry and science. It was so intimidating, you know, and I still got C's. Oh, <laughs> but the point chemistry is, was never mine. Oh, but, but the yes. point <laughs> is you make, it, you make it enjoyable and exciting and somebody wants to learn, you give these, these words like meaning, really meaning yes. and purpose. And I so appreciate Rose, it was a gold find that you found her. It was amazing. <laughs> well, <laughs> you found you guys. Bethany. That's very <laughs> sweet. I appreciate it. I, I hope I was helpful for the folks listening. And if there's any questions that come up, I'm more than happy to do my best. I, a scientist knows almost nothing. We're always just asking questions and answering them, but I will do my best. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's what we have to do. I love that humility. I love that humility. I love it. Really, we're going to post this on our, our YouTube. We'll send you a copy. You are welcomed in our TMS Roundtable studio anytime. Really, so nice Thank to you. meet you. You this are lovely. Uh, Thank a you. shining light. Have a good night, a good day, ladies. God bless Bye. everybody. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.